All right, we live. All right, let me jump off of this. All right, peace, 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 Baba. How are you doing, brother? My big brother I feel the day I was just telling the family that um some of the most um rebellious captives POWs were in the island of Jamaica, and that was something that was very near and dear to my heart. And I really appreciate uh, this presentation that you are going to give our people today on the Nat Turners, so to speak. Exactly. As a matter of fact, I called two of the brothers. I'll, I'll say it in the presentation. You see, I called two of them the Nat Turners of Jamaica. And yes. it's sad because the story, when you hear the story, family, it's the same thing. It's the same thing what they did to Nat Turner. In the movie Birth of a Nation, we see how somebody snitched and went back to the master. I don't know exactly what happened, but that's what happened in Jamaica too. You're always going to have some boot-licking house nigger that's going to say, hey, run back to master and tell him. And these, these things, and Baba, these people need to know that. They don't teach us this in school in Jamaica. Right. They don't teach you this. Because if they teach you this, they feel it might raise up some other revolutionary to do the same thing. So they're not going to do it. So I just want to say to the people, um, hold on, let me just let the people on Facebook know I'm live, yeah. on, um, live on Baba TV. I'm doing I'm the same Baba, thing. Baba TV, YouTube. All right. Right now. Um, Rasta. And resistance. And I want to um, explain to the family that I, 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 there's a lot of things I can say, but I won't say, you know, because some information, some people can't, you know, they can't <laughs> deal with it at a certain level. You know what I'm saying? They can't understand certain things. And um, people are used to me talking about the Hebrews. They used to be talking about the Moors going at their beliefs. But I have to humbly say, when I study this, I realize why people are mad at me when I talk about their personal beliefs or personal system that they follow. Because when I'm studying this, there's a lot of hurtful things in it that I can't repeat. And sometimes you can't accept the truth when you grow up in something. You know what I'm saying? You can't accept. When I said the other day, I saw in the, the live, I talked about marijuana and where it came from, the root of it and all that stuff. I got so many calls from my people, man. Yo, it, it, it's, it's like, it's crazy. So people mm -hmm. can't accept certain truth because of it's their own conviction. Notice, yeah. notice whenever I speak on Sonnet or any channel, I never speak against somebody's faith because I know your faith is important. Your God that you call on, whether it's Allah, Yahweh. I, I never say anything really about Allah or Yahweh. But I speak about what archaeology, history, and um, external evidence can prove. I won't speak about Yahweh and what he's done because that's a part of the unknown. Nobody really knows. So right. you join an organization that said, hey, we know they have the God of the gaps theory. Because a lot of people say, Goffy, what do you believe in? Well, part of what I, 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 I accept and know is a part of what Rasta is. And, and the first thing I'm going to say today is that Rasta is um resistance struggle and rebellion against white supremacy so that would tell us from me saying that originally that rasta can mean anybody it could mean you here in america it could mean you in africa in south africa it could mean anybody rasta is all about struggle against white supremacy at the end of the day and once you see what i present you know, we're going to talk and back and forth and we're going to get into some deep stuff. But hey, let me um, share my screen so we could just get into it. But before I start, does anybody have any questions in the audience <clears throat> that they want me to address before I get into anything? All right. Let me just look at anything here. All right. Cool. All right. So, hey, peace, peace, peace to the truth story. And man, that's one of my, my master teachers right there from the um, MBK and Dagger Squad. <clears throat> and he just said Nat Turner was Aiken, just like the Jamaican Maroons. And if you look at um, the, the sister that did the Underground Railroad, she was a part of that Obeya system that Nanny did also. I'm not going to touch on Nanny. I know you wanted me to touch on Nanny today. I'm going to leave Nanny for another time, all right? Okay. But um, I'm just going to touch on a little things because I do have a show at 10 o'clock. So if I rush a little thing, rush everything here, I do have a show every Sunday at 10 o'clock called... Um, man cave sundays and actually i had a debate set up 
with um my brother Rob Bond and uh, another brother, Hebrew brother, debating about Sumer and all that archaeology stuff. So I didn't want to break that appointment because I had it, but I wanted to keep my word to you, my brother, that I would do it this morning. So I have to keep my word. All right. Thank you so much, yes, brother. sir. Yes, sir. So let me um share my screen. How do I do that? Share my screen here. And I'm going to um let me know if you could see my screen, beloved. If you could see my screen, let me know. And then I could yep. just go into it. All right. Well, it just went out. Yeah, I can see it now. All right. So basically, ladies and gentlemen, Rasta, I, although I have it wrong right here, re resist Rasta to me. You don't have to have the same meaning as I do. Because a lot of people think Rasta starts in the 1930s. The Rasta movement is a movement of struggle that's been it was brought into existence by the rebellions that have gone on for years. So this is what Baba is trying to tell y'all. The rebellions is what made Jamaica what it is. It's not the fact that somebody started growing locks and smoking marijuana. That is not what the Rasta movement is about. It started from when we came off the slave ships in Jamaica. All right, so let me just say that Rasta to me, this is my definition, it don't have to be yours is resistance, struggle, and rebellion against white supremacy. And white supremacy means the system that was put in place to control us, whether it's through their religion, whether it's through their culture, what they wanted to, us to adapt, it doesn't matter. All right? So that's what I wanted to um, talk about. But I, I'm going to go in order of what the, um, the rebellions that we've gone through in Jamaica, and I'm going to start off with the first Maroon War. Now, when we talk about the first Maroon War, for those who don't know, a maroon is somebody who is basically a runaway slave or somebody who has run away from under the control of the master. That's what a maroon is. So let's just don't get it twisted. A maroon at the time could be somebody who was native to the country, somebody who was captured, or anybody who was um, imported as a slave and was brought into the country. And the reason why we started 1665, although as natives, they were there way before any, um, anyone came into the country, is that 1665 is a, is a period where 1655, 10 years earlier, Jamaica was a Spanish country. We spoke Spanish at one time. Those were the first people that were quote unquote invaders that came into the country. So once those invaders came in, um, the British eventually had a little beef with them, came over, took over the country. So Spanish Town was the capital at the time when the Spain people were there, Spanish people were there. Spanish Town was the capital. So they took over, the British took over. And what happened is because of the Maroons and the Maroon fighting and so forth, it made it hard for the transition for the British. So eventually, <clears throat> the, um, the Maroons and the, the, the British, they had a little, you know, a little ceasefire and whatever, and they worked it out. But between 1665 and 1740, 40, there were many wars or many rebellions that the Jamaicans had. We were the most rebellious island in the Caribbean, in my opinion. We had some of the largest rebellions, the most devastating rebellions. And when you talk about monetary wise, over half a million at one point, it cost the British government at that time period. That's how much money it cost them. But remember, Jamaica was known for their sugar plantations. All right. So, all right. So let's move on now. Um, and in Richard Dunn's Sugar and Slavery, the author argues that the causes of the Maroon Wars were directly related to the numerous insurrections that plagued the island during the years of 1694 to 1704 and the number of slaves that ran away to join the Maroons. Small revolts had broken out on Jamaica's north coast. In 1694, 1702, and 1704, Runaways fleeing the repression that followed these revolts then attempted to hide with other ex-slaves in the mountains. This activity set the stage for the Maroon Wars of 1720 to 1739. Dunn argues that these revolts were the cause of the war, yet other factors also contributed, especially the unwarranted aggression of the planters towards the Maroons. Outraged at the fact that the Maroons remained free, Slave owners feared that the Maroons represented a symbol of hope for the slaves who were still in captivity. The Maroon villages were a place of refuge for the runaway slaves, Edward says. From time to time, without the least provocation, 
and by their barbarities and outrages, the Maroons intimidated the whites from venturing to any considerably distance from the sea coast. The island was the whites and the slavery, the Africans' proper state, or so thought the planters. And planters even feared that the Maroons' independence undermined the property value of their own land. Edwards also makes mention of the fact that the English were offended when the Maroons inadvertently refused the proclamation offered by Lieutenant Governor Sir Charles Littleton. This resulted in yet still further aggression by the English, who sent a white militia into the interior to subdue the Maroons. The Maroons, in turn, unleashed their vengeance upon the white planters, raiding plantations at night, killing whites regardless of their age, even after the first Maroon War ended. And by the way, let me go back to something here. We talk about about killing people regardless of the age. I don't know if you remember when Khalid Mohammed said he would kill the babies, he would kill that. At this time period, because of our anger towards these folks, we never considered the age. We don't care if who they were. As long as they were white, they were killed. Even after the first Maroon War ended in the famous treaty between the leader, Kojo, and the, current, the colonial government of Jamaica, conflict between the two warring parties continued. The size of the Maroons grew considerably after 1740 and they soon wanted more land to sustain their growing population and according to 18th century author rc dallas by the late 1700s the maroon men had become increasingly friendly with the slave women and in numerous cases fathered children with slave women he who connected himself dallas claimed with a woman whose brother sister or other relations were fugitives would probably be tempted to remit his pursuit of them and even favor their concealment what this meant was that when the relatives of these Maroon children ran away from the plantations, the Maroons were more than eager to help these new runaways. This, great angered, this greatly angered the planters who used the new situation as an excuse to break the terms and conditions of the peace treaty of 1738. All right. So this was from an article from Miami University um, regarding the Maroons. Um, you could go to that website if you want. By the 18th century, the Maroons viewed the planters as a clear and present danger to their autonomous way of life. The planters viewed the Maroons as an unruly, rebellious group that threatened their lavish and luxurious way of life that had grown accustomed to. All right. So now, when you look at some of the rebellions that happened, you're talking about Nani, of course. You're talking about Kojo. And I'm not going to talk about Nani. I'm just going to talk about Kojo today. Kojo was the leader of Jamaica's Maroons, a fugitive black slave during the first Maroon War between the British colonial government and the communities of runaway slaves in the islands, mountainous interior. With his sister Nanny and his brothers, Akompong, Johnny, and Kwaku, and Kojo led 5,000 rebel slaves in a successful armed resistance to re-enslavement, forcing the British government to grant them a degree of semi-autonomy that continues in force today under Jamaica's independent government. This achievement places Kojo among the ranks of the most successful opponents of slavery in the history of Americas. According to Maroon oral tradition, Kojo was the son of Naquan, Naquan, a prince or chief of the Akan, a Coromantian people of West Africa's Gold Coast region in what is modern-day Ghana. Captured with 600 of his tribe's people by Spaniards, Naquan was sold into slavery in Spanish Jamaica in the 1640s. Shortly after his arrival, he instigated a revolt against his new masses and led them into the island's rugged interior, establishing the first community of Maroons from the Spanish Cimarron. Runaways continued to increase the Maroon population, especially during the English conquest of Jamaica in 1655, when many former Spanish slaves took advantage of the chaos to flee enslavement. Kojo was born into this free community in the late 17th century and succeeded to the chiefdom upon his father's death at the advanced age of 90. To protect the Maroon community from frequent British raids against them, Kodja divided them into five towns, three in the eastern Blue Mountains and two in the nearly in impenetrable cockpit country in the west, and placed his sister and brothers in charge of different communities. Once open hostilities of the first Maroon War erupted in 1730, command of the Maroons divided between Kodja in the west and Nani in the east. Under their leadership, the Maroons practiced a highly skilled form of guerrilla warfare, complete with a form of camouflage known as ambush and an elaborate communication system using native horns and drums. Now, I want to point out to a lot of people that with the folks that they took from West Africa, some of them were already warriors. So they knew how to fight because they grew up in a system when they already were prepared for war and they had their own communities. 
So when you look at Kojo and Nani, the brother and sister, they grew up in West Africa, the Gold Coast, where they were already in position to defend and fight and so forth. So they brought some of those tactics that they knew from West Africa to Jamaica. All right, this is how we could connect ourselves to West Africa and know we're in a, in a way where we come from because we pick up on certain things. You know, we pick up on the Anansi story and different stories that the Akan holds and, 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 and stories that we know from West Africa or Ghana. And we continue those traditions orally, you know, because there are stories that my mom told me orally that I never learned in school regarding this culture. All right. Um, although Koja failed to gain his foremost wish to be repatriated to West Africa, the treaty terms provided unprecedented liberty to the former slaves. The Maroons were ceded the lands they held at the armistice. The British and the Maroons observed a three-mile no-man's land between their respective territories. Koja and his successors had full sovereignty over their people except the power to execute male factors. And the Maroons agreed not to harbor future runaway slaves. Now, this agreement originally was not followed by the Maroons. And eventually it, they did um, start doing it because basically what the Maroons were doing, they didn't, the British didn't want more runaway slaves. So they say, you know what? You could have your land. We'll have an overseer there. Make sure you do what you got to do. You're going to be in charge of the land, but we're going to be there too. But we're not going to attack you anymore. We're not going to stop you from being independent right here. But the issue is they didn't want future runaway slaves, so they agreed to capture them and return any they found to the British authorities in exchange for a bounty, money or whatever. This last provision, as you can see right here in the line, Mar Maroons agreed not to harbor future runaway slaves, returning any they found to the British authorities in exchange for a bounty. This last provision has complicated the Maroons' relationship with descendants of other Africans in Jamaica. Known for many years by the enslaved and free black communities as the King's Negroes, the fiercely independent Maroons stand as symbols of both collaboration and successful resistance to slavery. So in a way, you're happy that the Maroons broke away and had their own spot, but they were still under some sort of British control. You know what I'm saying? Because they was returning people that was running away and they ended up working for the government in a sense. All right? But on the other hand, the British realized they couldn't beat them up so they say, you know what, let's just give them this for the sake of giving them that so there's no problems. Um, Kodja died suddenly at Nanital in the Blue Mountain five years after peace was concluded and was succeeded by his brother Akompong. The epitaph on his now lost grave marker written by Stephen Gregory Harris, a Briton who had settled among the Maroons many years earlier, read, Kodja, a Maroon forever free. The impact of Kodja's military victory is suggested by Milton McFarlane, one of Kodja's descendants, who remarked that it probably would have taken them the British ab 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 abolitionists twice as long to abolish slavery had it not been for the Maroon victory that gave the British cause to think. McFarlane, 1977. This area was written by Thomas W. Creese. And of course, the book is The Historical Encyclopedia of World Slavery, Volume 1, Volume 7 by Junius P. Rodriguez, page 203. All right. So now let me move on. Before I go to the Jamaicans and that Turners, um, hold on, let me just check something real quick here. If we have any questions in the side chat or anything, anybody want to ask any questions? I am yeah, here. I do. Um, real briefly, um, Brother Garfield, and it, it was said that uh, uh, Marcus Garvey came directly from the Maroons. Was that, is that true? To be honest, um, Marcus Garvey was in St. Anne's, so he was connected because I'm going to show like there's an ultra-rious connection. And the ultra-rious connection is with the, that St. Anne's area, the North Coast, is that's where majority of the Akon people went. So that's how Garvey is connected because in that area, you see, when I talk about the Jamaican Nat Turners, you're going to see the Takiwars. He particularly singled out the people who was from his culture, the Akon. So the Akon people were some fighters and warriors, and Marcus Garvey grew up around that area. So more than likely, he was a part of the whole Akon, Akon clan. I've never really researched that. I don't know if my, my brother um, Danny True Story has, but he grew up in St. Anne's and that's where they were. So we have to take in consideration, it's speculation on my part, but more than likely it's a possibility because based on um, what he has done and, and, and um, where he was, you know what I'm saying? So I would go as far as saying it's a, it's a strong possibility that he was a part of that. You know, it, I'm not fits. Gonna... it fits. 
yeah, it fits. But for me right now, it's speculation because I haven't looked into it. You know what I'm saying? So I'm not going to um, jump and say 100% yes. I would have to research it and I would have to um, put some time into, um, into doing a full research on that whole thing as far as him um, being directly from there. But, but for now, I would say um, the brother is connected to the, um, to the Akon based on that. And I'm sure my brother Truth Story and he's in a, he's, he's in the chat, basically probably agreeing and saying, you know what, maybe it's true or whatever. But I'm not gonna put put that because you know when you deal with scholarship, you know sometimes you can assume. But I don't want to speculate based on his fight, based on his the era where he grew up. He was definitely a part because he was a part. He grew up in Saint Anne's. If you know his history, he was in the fighting area. That's where all these people are from. There's no coincidence. That's where all of them are from. Um, go ahead, Baba. Let me let me get my um hold on one second. Go ahead, Baba. You could you could speak for give me 10 seconds. Right. Yeah, I just wanted to say that, you know, the Maroons that was kicking the butts of those white folks up there, uh, I mean, fought them to the end. And wasn't there a treaty that was they tricked the, the brothers with some treaty? Yeah, the treaty, the treaty that they had, right? was um a treaty basically for peace because the, the british the british to to be honest with you the maroons didn't have to um didn't have to um what you call it go by the treaty but what happened is kojo was getting old so the older he got because if you notice a while ago i just realized something in the presentation that the, the, the oral tradition actually is kind of off because of his age unless he was like 120 you know he was very old so for him to um to 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 be at a certain age and do certain things, it don't really make any sense. So we'd have to. I'm a, I'm I'm gonna have to look wow. into that. All right, but I will say, um, as my brother True Story said, it's possible for sure that you know the the, the 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 maroons and so forth. All right, let's let's look let's look at this though. With the deal that they cut, the treaty, they still had the overseer over them. They had a one representative, the British representative that was there. You know, because they didn't want to fight. And they were in the game of making money through the sugar plantation business. That's what the British was concerned about. You know what I'm saying? So for them, it's more of a money maker. They want to make sure that their money is in order. They could do certain things. So what happened is they were in a, um, was, was, I think they were in a seven-year war. So with, Brit, with, with Spain and France. So this was like the perfect time. But I'm, I'm going to talk about that um, further on when we get to the second Maroon War. All right. But for now, let me just say, let's move on to the Jamaica's Nat Turners, who I would call Taki, which I spelled it the Akon way. We spell it in English, T-A-C-K-Y, the Taki's War, and Three Finger Jack. All right. I'm going to use the same source I used before, which was the Historical Encyclopedia of World Slavery, Volume 1. I'm going to use it for Taki, Taki's Rebellion. And Taki's Rebellion was short. And I'm doing things in, in numerical order so that people can understand the growth of the Rasta movement. It's not just about Haile Selassie being Kale Emperor and being the king of Ethiopia, but this was something that was brewing that pastors and preachers and spiritualists would talk about there was going to be somebody who would rule in Africa. So that's the mentality that we have to think about when we're looking at all these things from 200 years before and how we grew into that. Because remember, the British would, would um, export people who were too hostile for them to other countries. You know, Brother, brother Danny does put, um, they sent them to Sierra Leone or whatever. But the issue is they would send them to different islands like Belize. They would send them after different wars and so forth. All right. And we're going to get into that shortly. But let's get into the Jamaican Nat Turners, man, that were called Taki and Three Finger Jack. All right. Taki's Rebellion was around 760 to 761. One of the two largest slave rebellions in Jamaican history was a revolt led again by a Coromante, that is Akon, from West Africa's Gold Close. It's not coincidence, ladies and gentlemen, that these people are Akon. Again, when people tell me that the Maroons are Moors, and you know, I'm not saying that Muslims did not come to Jamaica. Don't get me wrong. But you never hear the term Moor ever in Jamaican history. I have never heard a term more in Jamaican history, ever. And my mom was a history teacher. Never heard a term in Jamaica when I learned, not that they would teach us anyway, but I've never heard anybody until I came to this country saying that the people in Jamaica were Moors or whatever. 
Never heard that. So if you notice, and you, you're reading the history here, you, know, you notice they talk about the Akon, the Koramanti, and these are the people who are beating them up. You don't see nobody talking about no Quran. And bear in mind, I'm not saying Islam was never in Jamaica. Don't get me wrong. Because a lot of people were converted to Islam before they even came on a boat. So 30% of the people that came over on the slave trade, that, that's the statistic that they have, the consensus, is that 30% of the slaves that came over were Muslims. Of course I'm going to be in Jamaica. All right? Maybe another day I'll get into that. But um, the, the, more, the Maroons were never Moors, per se. They weren't that. They were more of the Akon, the Coromantes, as we call them. They were that kind of people. That's the tradition, the background that they have. That fighting, rebellious, um, what do you call it? Um, um, root. That's the root of them. All right? Anyway, um, Taki that began in, see again, the slave known as Taki that began in St. Mary's Parish. Again, that's where, what's his name come from? Um, around that region. That's where um, Marcus Garvey come Thank from. You. All right? Uh -huh. Parish in 1760 and eventually spread across the island. Taki organized a rebellion along ethnic lines. Did people hear what I just said? Taki organized a rebellion along ethnic lines, reportedly involving almost every Akan slave in Jamaica, but not mobilizing slaves from other African ethnic groups. That's very important. The revolt began on Easter Day, April 7th, 1760 with an attack on the fort at Port Maria, where 150 slaves seized gunpowder and muskets before marching south, gathering new recruits as they went. This sounds like Nat Turner. Although Taki was captured and executed within days, and the rebel band he led disintegrated shortly after, guerrilla war involving thousands of slaves continued for months afterward across Jamaica. The rebellion's total suppression was not announced until October 1761. The rebellion occurred at a moment of massive expansion in the Jamaican sugar industry. At least 120,000 African slaves had been imported in the previous 20 years, compared to 90,000 in the years 1721 to 1740, and 53,500 in the 20 years prior to that. In 1760, Britain was involved in the Seven Year War with France and Spain which both distracted planters from maintaining plantation discipline and reduced the slaves' food supply. St. Mary's Parish, where the rebellion began, had the highest, listen to me, ladies and gentlemen, St. Mary's Parish, where the rebellion began, had the highest concentration of Aiken slaves and the lowest concentration of whites in Jamaica. The, rebe the rebels wanted to expel all whites from Jamaica and establish a society that was independent of European powers. Now listen to this carefully. The rebels wanted to expel all whites from Jamaica and establish a society that was independent of European powers. Now again, when I reach to the Rastafarian, the four main guys that started Rastafarian, I want you to think about that for a minute. So you know that Rasta thought and mindset didn't just pop up out of the blue and because of Marcus Garvey and so forth. This is a tradition and what they have grown up under for years and what they wanted. The rebels received spiritual guidance and courage from an Obia man who was captured in the early stages of the rebellion. This African slave prepared the rebels by giving them protective amulets. And the belief that Taki could not be killed by white bullets was also apparently very common among the rebels. The rebellion spread beyond St. Mary's with conspiracies and uprisings reported in Kingston, Spanish Town, Clarendon, St. Elizabeth, St. James, and Westmoreland. Although Taki's band of rebels was dissipated relatively quickly, ongoing disturbances continued for months in the western part of the island. By the time the rebellion was completely suppressed, nearly 400 slave rebels had been killed in fighting and another 100 executed, and around 500 transported mainly to British Honduras, now Belize. About 60 whites and another 63 blacks and people of color had been killed by rebels. So now, their solution the British, was to transport 500 of these guys to British Honduras. All right, let me take, um, let me take a look in the, in the chat. Um, <laughs> Artie Buckley's funny. Was Westmoreland named by the Moors? Funny, funny guy. All right. Brother Garfield, talk a little bit about Leonard Howell, because a lot of us, um, 
uh, some of us have oh, swept him shoot. under the rug, but he's oh, a very shoot. intricate part in the foundation of Rastafari. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right, let me let me sweep through my presentation and come down to Leonard Howell a little bit, and um, and let me just apologize to everybody. We started late, but um, let me get to Leonard Howell real quickly here, and it's not Leonard Howell alone. All right, we have to, and that's one of the things, because when everybody heard I was making a presentation, you know my people from Jamaica gonna hit me up, Baba. They're like, yo, why you only talk about Leonard Owell? When I talk to Hassan Nitta, they're like, oh, Leonard Owell, is I know all of this family, but it's good to know that, you see, it goes back again to what I said at the beginning of the program. When you're gonna talk about something sensitive and close to your heart, a lot of people get passionate. So when the, when the Hebrews and the Muslims and the Moors hear me talk about their system, their doctrine, I see why it hurts now, to be honest. I have to humbly say that. Because now all my friends are calling me, you better say this, you better say that. People who haven't even hit me up on Facebook for, for years saw the post and decided to inbox me and all that stuff. But four men that thought about Selassie changed the Rasta movement. And these four men are Archibald Dunkley, Joseph Hibbert, Leonard Howell, Robert Hines. All right. This is a picture of um, Joseph Hibbert in his uniform later in his years, all right? This is- um, yeah, Like Chris Emanuel. Yeah, 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 yeah. Joseph, Joseph Hibbert right there. And um, let me talk about Robert Hines real quickly. He's a Garveyite, Robert Hines, associated with the early Rastafarians, a follower of Alexander Bedward, who was uh, among those arrested on Bedward's 1921 march. Heinz um, was uh, the most successful, Chevron's called Heinz the most successful of all Rastafari in terms of membership. Heinz led an organization of over 800 members on roll and turned out at functions of a couple hundred. All right. Um, and that's the source right there if you want to read up some more on it. But let me touch on um, Leonard Howell. He's considered the first Rasta, but you know, you know there's the four guys. He was born in Jamaica in 1898, all right? It is known that Leonard Howell sought work and lived in Harlem from 1924 to 1930. In 1929, very interesting, Howell ran a tea house where cannabis, smoking, and behang beverages were served. At the time, New York City had over 400 marijuana tea houses or viper dens, tea jukes, and tea pads, as they were variously called, before marijuana prohibition began in 1937. However, the UNIA building where Garvey's group had rented Howell space was alarmed at this reefer den and decided to ostracize Howell, ejecting him from the UNIA and his tea house in 1930. All right? <laughs> Just for the record. So he had these little weed houses. You know, ain't nothing wrong with that. It was big time. That was his thing. So he was deported from the U.S. in 1932. Howell returned to Jamaica, a man on a mission, virtually unknown. Howell started preaching a never-before-heard doctrine. Rastafari as Messiah returned to earth. In all his speeches delivered with no success in Kingston, but enthusiastically received in the rural parishes, he began to lay down a philosophy that heralded a black liberation movement inspired by the, bar, the Bible, Marcus Garvey, and the struggle of the black people. A spiritually uplifting code of behavior and belief under the divine inspiration of Rastafari, Makanet, Emperor Haile Selassie I. This is a picture of um, Garvey and, and him right here. This is him on the left, Leonard Howell. All right, I don't know who the brother is in the middle. All right, the six things that Leonard Howell went by, the fall of the Rastafari movement. Now, I want you to go back to what I read in 1760 with the tacky and look at this. One, hatred for the white race. Two, the complete superiority of the black race. Revenge on whites for their wickedness. The negation, persecution, and humiliation of the government and legal bodies of Jamaica. Preparation to go back to Africa and acknowledging Haile Selassie as the supreme being and only ruler of black people. Listening to Howell were mostly young male field workers laboring under intense sun and humidity. Many of them smoked ganja, as it was called, day and night. The cannabis was brought to Jamaica by Indian merchants in 1882 and was found fertile growing conditions on the island where it was used in alcohol, tinctures, salves, and oils. It was around 1990 when ganja was smoked, usually by young plantation workers, as it kept them musical and cool in the heat. The ganja also directed their thoughts to social injustice. Indeed, there were to be uprisings in 1935 to 1938 in parishes 
where Howell was um, Howell had preached and Ganja was smoked. All right, I'm gonna leave it right there for now with Howell. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna touch on something real quickly here for, for, for those um cause since that we kind of like Russian. All right. We have um I didn't get to talk about Paul Bogle and the, um and I didn't get to talk about Sam Sharp and the Baptist War. I didn't get to talk about Paul Bogle and George William Gordon being hung and killed back to back days, October twenty third and October twenty-fourth, nineteen, I mean eighteen sixty-five, I think. Which was two, those are two national heroes, by the way, and Sam Sharp is a national hero. Um, so out of this Howell movement, you had these guys that came up. You had four different type of Rastafarians, the main ones. You had the Bobo Ashanti. You had the Youth Black Faith, which is the Nyabingi. You had the, the Howellites. And you had one more. Um, the 12 tribes. Tribes. 12 tries, right. Thank you, my brother. See, I can't depend on Baba for that, man. All right. So pretty much you had these four groups. And it's important that people understand. The Naya Bingi is the youth who started to grow their locks in, in, in a rebellious manner to say that, hey, we're growing our locks and we're going we're gonna to go around and we're going to um, go against this government. They would, they, these people um, from the youth black movement, man, they were some serious guys. Um, the youth, they call them the youth black faith grew in numbers. A new structure consisting of a chairman and table man replaced the leader, chaplain, and so forth. They were very disciplined. They were not passionate in denouncing traditional practices related to those of the early revival traditions. And people need to understand, though, they started in 1949, but this was the youth. This was a youth movement. And, 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 and it's, it is key that we understand that they revolted against the revival tradition and Obiaman who burned candles and oils. So the Naya Bingi never lived up because, you know, you had Bedward who was a revivalist. You know what I'm saying? And teach about Obian doing spirit stuff and burning candles and oils. They were totally against that tradition. That tradition was with Robert Hines, who is one of the four guys who was the main guys at the beginning. The youth black faith were against that since the Apostle John had declared Christ the only golden candlesticks. These young brethren respected their elder leaders, but were looking for more active reform. They wanted to eliminate practice that related to those of the revival tradition. They wanted to distinguish themselves. You know what I'm saying? So they had order, man. I mean, every Wednesday night was prayer night. This was a duty and an obligation. Punctuality and conduct were taken into consideration and duties of, of young black faith members. In order to be in this group, one's faith had to be pure, if one was given the name of warrior, it meant that their conviction was noticed and they were an accepted member of the youth black faith. Now, before I even go into more into that, so remember, you had the youth black faith, which is Naya Bingi, you had the 12 tribes, you have the Bobo Ashanti, and you had the people who follow Howell, Leonard Howell, the Howellites. Now, Howell and the gentleman called, um, I said his name earlier, not Dunkley, Let, um, Leonard Howell and Joseph Hibbert merge. Now, when Selassie came to Jamaica, Howell didn't meet up with it in person, but it's alleged that Hibbert did. And what, what Selassie did was he sent somebody from the Ethiopia Orthodox Church. So when Leonard Howell was in jail or whenever he was in St. Thomas, Hibbert brought the Ethiopian Orthodox to Leonard Howell's movement. Leonard Howell, when he came out of jail or returned, he did not like it. So he kicked Joseph Hibbert out. So the connection with Selassie and the Ethiopian Orthodox Church was through Hibbert, which had his own little thing going, all right? Um, I didn't even get to talk about the Hindu connection and the whole Rastafarian thing about, you know, but, you know, I mean, a lot of things trace back to Africa. A lot of things trace back to the Indian Hindu connection. I mean, curry goat, we know curry goat is a, is a food or curry chicken that we like is an Indian thing. Um, certain things as far as um, the, the smoking, the, the locking up of the hair, and so forth, a lot of those things have to do with the Hindus. You know, not saying that we didn't lock our ears. You look at the Momo people, you look at the people in, um, in um, what is it, not Nigeria, in um, Zimbabwe. They also had locks and so forth. So it's not like in they the are Mama originally the locks. Rising, right. um, did, yeah, yeah. What is it, Mbiko? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. So those are the things that we, we, um, we, you know, we incorporated in it, but let me tell you something, man. These four groups, I'm going to get into it on another day. Me and Baba are going to set it up. But just to continue, just remember, it's, it's, it's Robert Hines, Archibald Dunkley, 
Joseph Hibbert, and Leonard Howell. Those are the people that preach in that Selassie was the fulfillment and he's the Messiah or something to that effect. They all didn't teach the same thing, but they pretty much um, talked about a king in Africa. And what made Selassie special was the claim of the Kebron Agas when he used that he was a part of the Solomon and David lineage. And this is what uh, people, people might say I'm wrong or right, but this is what Selassie and the Rastafarians have over a regular Hebrew or a Christian. They could say that the tradition shows that he's related to the lineage of David. Whether it's true or not, that's what their history says. In the Christian history, I mean, we have somebody that allegedly is you know, connected to David, but we don't know for sure. But with this guy, it's a part of his history. You know, true or not, it is. And we have to respect that. You know what I'm saying? If I'm talking about it, if it's a debate segment, then it's different. I could come with something else. But as far as the historical part of it, of what they believe and what they follow, they're saying that David and Solomon is in the lineage of Haile Selassie, um, Rastafari. All right? So I'm going to leave it there for now, family. If anybody have any questions, I'm going to take it. I'm late for my next program. I'm going to start. Forgive me for um, rushing, but... Um, I'm gonna We're going to do it again, to, Brother Garfield, and I just want to thank you for giving me my time, your time and uh, to let the family know that I have a new channel dedicated to the Rastafarians. My first touch with any uh, type or form of black blackness came through Rastafarians before mm -hmm. I knew or came in touch with the Nation of Islam or anybody else, and they didn't teach me integration. They taught me the great history of black kings and rulers and how never to follow in the ways of the white man. So that always stuck with me probably at 10 or 11 years old. Um, they were very nationalistic brothers and sisters and pan-Africanists to the core. We know that. I got to apologize because I never got to mention um, Bookman and Bedward, who is in between all of this stuff. So when you look at Bookman, Bookman was born in Jamaica. He was the guy. And I have to say this before the show is over, man. Let me bring this up real quick. I got to say his prayer. Bookman's prayer is one of the best prayers anybody could ever read, whether you believe in God or not. Bookman is a beast. And we need to recognize that Dutty Bookman was no joke. I, over, over, I went over his part, but let me just say the prayer that he said. A prayer, Dutty Bookman began the rebellion with a prayer to the people. Bookman's prayer. Good God who created the sun, which shines on us from above, who rouses the sea and makes the thunder rumble. Listen. God, though hidden in the cloud, watches over us. The God of the white man calls forth crime, but our God wills good works. Our God, who is good, commands us to vengeance. He will direct our arms and help us. Throw away the likeness of the white man's God, who has so often brought us to tears, and listen to liberty, which speaks in all our hearts. I just want to say, man, that's the prayer. Hmm. You know, his philosophy was conquer or die. I mean, eventually he was killed and replaced by a less effective Negro accommodationist leadership. As a result, the Haitian independence took much longer than it should have. By 1802, the revolution had fallen into the hands of a man of the same ilk as Dutty Bookman. He was an African war general named John Jakes Dessalines. He became the liberator of Haiti. And I just want to close out by saying that. I say again, thank you, um, Baba, for allowing me the time. And I'm going to say um, peace and love. I'm going to be on the Dagger Squad channel in five minutes. I'm going to probably talk about this a little bit. You know, because remember, remember I said at the beginning what Rasta mean. Rasta represent resistance, struggle, and rebellion against white supremacy. And all of them do it. But remember also, some of them start integrated with white people. So yeah, <laughs> you know, right. it's crazy right now. It's crazy right now, man. But, you know, but all of us have. Yeah, all yeah, all of us, us have some way, somehow. Yeah, man. Mm -hmm. True story and say, I universal. <laughs> hey, and I have to throw, throw my words right here, man. A, a person I said the other day that Dr. Yaw said he was the one that came up with Overstand. They got to understand the iatics or the language that the Rastas made up from the 50s and 60s. They made up their own language. And Overstand was one of the words in their language. So when you hear Dr. Yaw say, not, not a shade at Dr. York organization, but they were the ones that came up with it first. All right? True. Yeah, man. So peace and love, brother. And thanks for allowing me and giving the opportunity to come on your channel live, trusting me to do this.
Yo, thank you, know you for giving me your time, brother, and doing this with Baba TV. I love you, brother. Peace. I love you too, brother. I'll be on um, Dagger Squad in five minutes. Peace and love. One.